There's going to be several worked examples today on uh, practice using those kinematic formulas, in particular, the transport equation. So let me remind you the transport equation is. So we'll be using it, right? using transport equation a lot. If you've got uh, a frame, B frame that rotates with respect to an N frame. So these are these are names I've given to frames. Typically the N frame will be the inertial frame, but this holds for any two frames. It's the B frame. B frame can be, you know, something else. So these two frames are related by an angular velocity vector, which is B with respect to N, okay? Then if we have um, for, for any vector A, it doesn't have to be a position or velocity, any vector A that we're gonna deal with, then the derivative of A with respect to the N frame is going to be the derivative of A with respect to the B frame plus the part that's due to just rotation. So omega, the angular velocity of B with respect to N cross A. You know, here's for completeness, there's a vector A. All right, so let's try this out. Uh, we'll use the example of polar coordinates, but I wanna give you a motivation. Like, well, why, why do we want to do this? So eventually we'll get to Newton's laws. And sometimes it's easier to use Newton's laws with one frame or another, although all of the derivatives need to be with, need to be expressed with respect to an inertial frame. So let's say uh, using Newton's laws, and we'll say for the pendulum. But trying to keep it simple. So the pendulum would be, whoa, pendulum. That's when you got something hanging from the ceiling, like right here, right? And then you, what's the equation of motion for that? Here's the pivot point. If we want, let's just call that point O. Makes life easy. And then there's a rod and a mass at the end. And then if you did some free body diagram, there'd be force due to the rod. We're not gonna care particularly right now about the free body diagram. Okay, there's just, there's forces on, on this thing. And if you were to approach this afresh, you might say, I'll, I'll use a, I'll put a Cartesian inertial frame and do everything with respect to that frame. So you'd say, oh, let me use this point O and I'll attach a frame to it, N1, N2, and just for good measure, let me throw in the third one. We have a right-handed inertial coordinate system. So the N frame is the uh, inertial frame. It's a convenient inertial frame. And then we'd say, well, where this mass is, that's our point P. So we'll write a vector. Where is P? We might also write this as the vector of P with respect to O. Because remember, that point is O. So if we've got all that going on, um, and then we wanted to write the equation of motion for P for this particle, right? We would, there's going to be some double derivative respect to time of this point P because that's the acceleration. So F equals MA is gonna be the total force, F total on this mass, 
F equals M times the acceleration, F equals MA. If you did this in terms of Cartesian coordinates though, so if we used, right, we, we have some choices. We could say, well, let's write RP is uh, X in the N1 direction plus Y in the N2 direction. I mean, that's, that's straightforward. Why wouldn't I do that? Here's X, here's Y. And then we take derivatives and things. Uh, so you would get, you would end up getting something that looks pretty horrendous. Uh, you'd get like X, X double dot is negative Y G tangent of, no, no, sine of arc tangent of negative X over Y, uh, blah, 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 blah. It'd be terrible. That's the main point. It would just look absolutely horrendous. So I'm putting blah. So this looks terrible. I say, well, it looks terrible, but it might be correct. Yeah, but we there's an easier way to do this. Right, we wouldn't use Cartesian coordinates if we're looking at a pendulum because we know we should be using the angle. We would be using polar coordinates. It's a lot easier in polar coordinates. How do you know ahead of time polar coordinates might work? Well, maybe you just find by trial and error. When there's stuff that's rotating, and in this case, we have a pendulum that's rotating then, that gives you a clue. So, what do we mean by polar coordinates here? Well, in this particular case, let me just do another sketch of the pendulum, right? We would write maybe theta and R, which implies that there's some polar frame, E R, E theta that we're using. And this frame rotates with respect to the inertial frame. So in this rotating E frame would be what we use. And for good measure, right, E3 coming out of the screen is going to complete the right-handed coordinate system. All right. So we would, if we, if we use this polar coordinate E frame, then the location of the particle can be written relatively easy because the ER direction always tracks where the particle P is. So we would have a scalar R in the ER direction. Yay. Okay. And I might just refer to this as R. I'll drop the subscript P because I think we all get it. All right. So to get this second derivative with respect to the inertial frame, and we'll still need that because Newton's laws only hold with respect to an inertial frame. So all derivatives must be taken with respect to an inertial frame, even though we can express the answer with respect to any frame we want. In this case, we'll use the polar coordinate frame. So we'll first start with taking the inertial derivative. So first, get the uh, inertial velocity, which the book sometimes just abbreviates this as R dot. And this is technically the time derivative with respect to the end frame of R. But we're using this polar coordinate frame to try to simplify our lives. So now we can apply the transport theorem from up above. We'd say, okay, this equals, our, we call this the E frame. So that's why I'm using time derivative with respect to E of R plus B 
the angular velocity of the E frame with respect to the N frame cross R. I guess that means we need to know what is, how does this frame rotate with respect to the other frame? Let me sketch this. N1, N2, and this was what? E R, E theta, okay. The rotation of this E frame with respect to the N frame, oh, and we need to have that uh, E3 is in the same direction as N3. So that third direction, that's the axis of rotation. We've got this rotating with the rate, you use, it's, you use the right hand rule, our fingers are going to curl in the direction of theta. So even though theta is defined this way, with respect to the negative N2 direction, in this case, what do we get? We would get theta dot uh, E3 or theta dot N3, okay. For this, let me use a, um, yeah, we'll just go ahead here. Let me describe what each of these terms are, just so it's clearer. This is the velocity with respect to the end frame. This is velocity with respect to the E frame. And this is the part that's the due to motion of E frame with respect to N frame. Okay. So let's just apply this. What if we were to look at, uh, here, here's the particle P in that E frame, but let's just jump on to the E frame. To get a better idea of what things look like in this frame. So in the E frame, uh, here's E sub R and then E theta, and then coming out of the screen E3. Here is point P. And we're calling this the vector R. So R is just R E R. If I were to take the derivative of this vector R, well now I've got uh, up here, I've got a scalar times a vector. So I would use the product rule. So this becomes derivative of scalar r times e r plus r derivative of e r. Okay, this, the frame doesn't matter when you're taking the derivative of a scalar. So this is the same as d by dt of r, or we'll call that r dot. So just collecting down here what all of these things are, we've got r dot in the e r direction, then plus, what's this? This is the time rate of change of the ER unit vector with respect to the E frame. The ER unit vector is attached to the E frame, so this is not changing. So we don't have any other term. That's all we've got. So that gives us this part up here. Okay, now we just need this other part. And we can work that out because we've got what uh, omega E with respect to N is. Okay, so 
omega of e with respect to n cross r. Just plug everything in. And what do we have? We'll have, um, this is theta dot e3 cross r e r. Pulling out scalars and everything. We've got r theta dot e3 cross e r. Now we could use the right hand rule. What's e3, just from looking at this diagram here in the middle left, e3 cross e r, my thumb is pointing in the e theta direction. So these two point in the e theta direction. So I've got r theta dot e theta. All right, plug those two in, what do I have? I've got that the inertial velocity of the point P is r dot e r plus r theta dot e theta. So this might look a bit weird, like I have expressed the inertial derivative of this point P um, with respect to this E frame, even though the derivative is taken with respect to the N frame. But that's, that's okay. I'm just expressing the components of a vector in some convenient frame. Another way I could write this, I might write this right hand side. It's, it's implied that there's a zero in the E3 direction. So I might write this as uh, r dot, r theta dot zero with the superscript out in front to remind me I'm writing the E, the components, E frame components. And they're ordered in the order E R, oops, E theta, E three, just like N one, N two, N three. So that is that. Now for me to use uh, Newton's law, I need to get the acceleration. So I'm gonna have to write the uh, um, the next derivative, okay. And so how do I do that? Well, this is just another vector, okay. So I could take this vector and plug it into the transport theorem. So let me write that. To get the inertial acceleration I just apply the transport theorem again. That was the first formula wrote up above. So this would be the derivative with respect to n of the derivative with respect to n of this vector r. So that's the inertial acceleration. And that will be inertial derivative with respect to E of the inertial derivative with respect of, uh, of N of R plus omega E with respect to N cross that, right? I just literally took, I'm taking this vector, plugging it in. It's just another vector, okay. So I take those two derivatives and this, this is the inertial acceleration, right? This is two derivatives with respect to time, of the inertial frame of that vector R. Okay, now maybe things get a little bit more interesting here, but it's not, it's not the end of the world. So what is this? Uh, I've got, I'll just plug in, what I have is the right-hand side up here Uh, R dot E R 
plus r theta dot d theta. And then r dot e r plus r theta dot e theta. Remembering what this is, what is omega? It is theta dot e3. And then just carry everything through. I'm gonna be tilting things a little bit this way. Okay, so this is, um, I know that when I take the derivative with respect to the E-frame of either of the two unit vectors, I get zero, so I can ignore that. So I'm going to have d by dt of r dot er plus d by dt r theta dot e theta. That's for the first part. Now, the second part that's due to rotation, I will get um, plus theta dot r dot e3 cross er plus r theta dot squared e3 cross e theta. All right, uh, I, I guess I'll take these derivatives over here first. So this derivative with respect to time of r dot, I will call that r double dot, All right? And now I use the product rule here. So this is r dot theta dot plus r theta double dot in the e theta direction. This is e r direction. Okay, those are the, the left two terms. Now over here, I've got to use the right hand rule and maybe I have to sneak up here to remind myself. Maybe I'll use this diagram up here in the upper right, so e three. E3 cross ER is E theta. E theta. And E3 cross E theta is negative ER. From, of course, the right hand rule. Uh, so, what do I have? Theta dot R dot E theta. Actually, let me reverse the order. This call this R dot theta dot. And then over here, this is minus r theta dot squared er. You'll notice maybe a couple of these things are the same. r dot theta dot in the e theta direction. We've got r dot theta dot in the e theta direction. So we got two of those. So collecting all of our terms, the inertial acceleration, right? Our shorthand is this is vector r with a double dot over it. Our inertial acceleration, R double dot is, um, and I'll write it as you know, ER components and then E theta components. R double dot minus R theta dot squared, the ER direction plus the E theta stuff, two R dot theta dot plus r theta double dot. And that's that's kind of interesting, all right. Um, we could even start naming terms if we really wanted to, like this thing, this negative r theta dot squared er is the uh, centripetal acceleration And this factor of two, whenever you have a factor of two, that's a sign, this is a Coriolis acceleration. So two r dot theta dot e theta is the Coriolis. And again, we've done something weird. We've expressed the derivative with respect to the end frame, but written it in E frame components. And that's perfectly okay. And we could write it if we wanted to in the E frame where there's an implied, there's zero in the E3 direction. So once again, R double dot minus R theta dot squared to R dot theta dot plus R 
double dot and then zero. It's just writing it in matrix form, which might be easier sometimes. And you could, if you need to get the acceleration in terms of the inertial acceleration in terms of polar coordinates, here's what you could have done. So this was supposed to be the easy way because it's more general and will definitely help you with rigid body kinematics. The other way, the other way to get, let's call this formula, I'm gonna call it star. Direct substitution, this is the thing that you've probably known and done. So you would write what is X and what is Y in terms of theta and R. So, um, so you'd write X, there was Y, let's call this theta and R. So in this case, um, X equals R Signed like this isn't what you always use for polar coordinates, but for this particular situation, this is what we used. Okay. So X is R sine theta. And I guess we have to writing Y, Y is going to be negative R cosine theta. Right, because we've defined N1 increases that way to the right and N2 increases this way to the left. So that's why there's a negative there. So then you would plug this in. You'd say, okay, I've written R. I'm just copying what we had up above. X plus Y and two. And then you would substitute in R sine theta in the N1 direction plus negative R cosine theta in the N2 direction and take derivatives knowing that if you once you take the derivative of anything any of these unit vectors with respect to n any of the n unit vectors is not changing with respect to n so you're just taking a whole bunch of you're using your trig identities like crazy and taking derivatives and you could do that and then you could do it again right and then you'll be then you'll you'll get something it's got, uh, let's call it the X acceleration. It'll be a function of R and theta and R dot, theta dot, R double dot, theta double dot. It's hard even to write. Plus the acceleration with respect to Y, R, theta, R dot, theta dot. Right, and these are complicated expressions that I don't even want to look at. Oh, but wait. Mm, we want to write this in polar coordinates. So within to, with respect to the polar directions, not the end directions. I say, well, well, hold on, why is that? Well, actually one of the forces is along one of the E direct, this is parallel to e, ER. So it's actually going to be easier for you if you write uh, Newton's law in the polar coordinate frame. So now you got to transform from the end frame back to the, uh, the polar coordinate frame. So you've got to, you've got to write that matrix. Okay, how does N1 and N2 relate to ER and E theta? And there's some stuff in there. And you do all that, and at the end of the day, right, you'll get a R which is going to be some function of R, theta, R dot, theta dot, R double dot, theta double dot, the R plus A sub theta, R theta, blah, blah, blah. Okay. You'll, you'll do lots of transformations, but you'll end up with the same thing up here, which you've got in a pretty straightforward way. I mean, like, what was the big challenge here? The right-hand rule, maybe? Okay, and look, it's nice and quick. So you can get 
you'll find the same thing as equation star, but you will have taken the long road to get there. And this was actually part of, um, if you want to double check this, it's homework one, homework zero, problem two, was to uh, take you through that journey so that you would appreciate the transport theorem. And so polar coordinates, you might go, well, what's so, who cares about polar coordinates? What about other situations? And yeah, there, there's other situations where you might want to um, use this approach. All right. So let me give you another example. As this one will be in 3D. This will be kind of weird. It's like, a, uh, I call it the ring and slider problem. We don't mean onion rings and like sliders, like burgers. I'm gonna move you over here, Mr. Ring and Slider. Like what the, what is this? Yeah, really. So there's a small ring at uh, the point P and that slides down on a bar. We'll call this bar B, bar B. And that's universally pivoted at this point Q. So this is a universal pivot. What does that mean? Uh, it's like a ball and socket joint. Okay. So that's this pivot is also sliding vertically up and down, up and down on that vertical rod. So we've got some coordinates written here. Got a few of them. We've got uh, H. So H can change, the height of the slider can change. R, the distance of the ring along that bar can change. And then we've got two angles. We've got this angle theta and this angle phi written in an old timey style. So we're, let's assume that those coordinates are known. It's something that we're tracking. Um, they're also, they have time derivatives. So they're changing with time. And eventually we're gonna wanna know, maybe e, the E frame is an inertial frame. We're gonna wanna know what is the position of P and its time rate of change. So from here to here, that's the position P with respect to O. We might just call that O P with a line over it. So we've got the location of the ring with respect to our origin O down here. We're gonna break that up into two pieces, O to Q plus Q to P. And here's what we're going to want at the end of the day. We're going to want the inertial, uh, the derivative with respect to the E-frame. Actually, we'll probably need two derivatives. We'll need the acceleration. But let's just say all for now, all we're going to get is the derivative with respect to the E-frame of that vector O to P. Well, we've written O, the OP vector is OQ plus QP. So we've got this. OQ plus Q P. All right. Now we can write what the derivative of O Q is, because what is O Q? O Q is, I'll draw this vector in maroon. There's O Q. O Q is distance h in the e3 direction. So it should be pretty easy to take the derivative of that with respect to the e frame. So that means derivative oq, so just h dot e3. 
Right, you might have, hold on. Why didn't we use a transport theorem? Because I'm taking the derivative with respect to the E frame. And look, this is already written in the E frame. So done. OK. The, the harder one, I guess you could say, is um, running out of colors. Come on. Oh, OK, green. All right, green. OK, from here to here. That is Q. P. Q, P. And we've got this B frame, which I, I would prefer this be written in blue. B for blue. And then maybe down here, this, this E frame, we'll write that in red. So, and I'll, I'll bring up my handy dandy. Here's this frame. So I guess it would be like, here's B1, B2, and B3. So the B1 direction points down this rod. B1 direction points down the rod. So that means QP is just a distance R in the B1 direction. So it's, it's easy to write with um, in terms of this B frame. You know, so you think of the B frame is attached to that bar, B. And now for me to get the derivative of this, so QP, well, now since I had to write this with respect to the, in terms of the B frame, uh, I'll need to use the transport theorem. So this will be, Derivative with respect to that B frame of R B1 plus, uh, how do we do this? This is the angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the E frame cross R B1. Right. And now I guess in some sense, the hard part, how do we get the angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the E frame. This isn't, um, we're not looking at just planar, you know, rotations in the plane anymore. We got, we got two and, oh, how do we do this? Okay, well, look at the situation. The way I, I like to think of it is, imagine if the two frames were lined up and then I'll see what series of rotations would need to happen. So, let me get these frames lined up. I've got my E frame and my B frame. So how many rotations are there? Well, first there's a rotation. There seems to be a rotation about the E3 direction through an angle phi. It's about the E3 direction, not the B3 direction. So I've got rotation about E3 through an angle phi. And then what? Um, this thing needs to tilt down. So there's a rotation about the B2 direction. Um, so, so what is omega B with respect to E? It is we first, we, we write the, um, the angular rate as well as the axis. And this is actually two rotations. So it's, we could write it as, you know, phi dot E3 plus theta dot B2. Okay. And this is, this is an okay way to write it, but if you look at this, this uh, cross product we're gonna have to do, we probably wanna write the omega vector completely in terms of B frame components. So that means we need to, we need to write this in terms of B frame 
components. So we'll have to do some trig. Hopefully we can kind of see here what's uh, what's going on. Let me write, here's E3. And, and at this angle that things are shown here, B3 is an angle theta away and um, B1. So we could write E3 is equal to its cosine theta B3 minus sine theta B1. So now we can write this angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the E frame completely in terms of B frame components. Um, and we should group them like B1, B2, B3. So what do we have here? We've got, uh, got negative sine theta times V dot B1 plus theta dot B2 plus cosine theta V dot D3. And now we need to evaluate omega cross RB1. And we could use properties of the cross product. Any vector cross the same vector is equal to zero. So this thing that's got B1 in it, that's just gonna be zero. I guess we could write it out for good measure. Um, and out in front, we could bring in all the scalars. So this will be negative R sine theta V dot B1 cross B1. But hey, I, I know that's zero. Plus um, R theta dot B2 cross B1. I'll wait till the end to figure that one out. Plus R cosine theta B dot B3 cross B1. All right, got to use the right hand rule. So B2 cross B1, my thumb is pointing in the, the negative B3 direction. So this goes into the negative B3 direction. B3 cross B1, my thumb is pointing in the B2 direction. So collecting terms and trying to put them in the order, like B1 component, B2 component, B3 component. This is R, oops, R cosine theta V dot B2 minus R theta dot B3. I also have to figure out uh, this highlight in purple here, this term, but that should be easy. This is just R dot B1. Okay, so I've got a, B, a B1, B2 and a B3 component. So collecting everything, what do I have? So kind of dropping down to here, the derivative of the vector from Q to P and um, yeah, now I'm just transcribing. So all the hard work is done. It took a while. And if if I wanted to get right from up here, the inertial derivative or the derivative with respect to the E frame of OP, then I just sort of add on this part. Remember that was written in terms of E3, but what do you know? We know how to write E3 in terms of the B frame. 
So we could we could collect everything um, and write it out. O P equals um, what was it? We'll have R dot. Hold on. Um, minus h dot sine theta b1 direction plus r cosine theta v dot b2 direction plus h dot cosine theta minus r theta dot in the b3 direction. And I think it would have been a lot harder to um, do the direct substitution method and get this, but that's just me. All right. It's the ring and slider. Try it at home. As an extra super duper challenge, take two derivatives. Lots of derivatives. All right. So something I did up here, let me scoot up here. We took, we got the inertial acceleration written in polar coordinates and like and interpreted some of these terms as this is the centripetal acceleration. This is the Coriolis. There's another way to get that and the book discusses it when it talks about a five part acceleration formula. So we can we can talk about the five part acceleration formula. I don't think they call it that, but that's what it is. This is in section 1.3.4. So let's say something about, about that, all right. So this sort of continues in the spirit of, I think it was the last lecture last week, where if we have a point P and they talk about an A frame and a B frame, I'd rather talk about an inertial frame because that's gonna be more useful to you. So this N frame and a B frame, which you know could be attached to some convenient rigid body. And the origin of this B frame, um, let's call it like the book O prime. So we've got a B frame. It's it translates and rotates with respect to the end frame. So it's got an angular velocity vector, right, is B with respect to N. And the way that we wrote all these vectors here was we've got location of P with respect to our inertial frame, we call that little r. The location of P with respect to our B frame, I call that rho. And then the location of O prime or the origin of the B frame with respect to the N frame was big R. So we've got in terms of uh, writing is like O to P, rho is O prime, to P and big R is O to O prime. So little r is big R plus rho. And 
so what we did last time is we used the the transport theorem and wrote the you know the the velocity of point p so this is some other notation the book uses with respect to the end frame and that's the same as the derivative of little r but we'll try to stick with what the book has. So the velocity of point P with respect to the inertial frame equals the velocity of the, basically the B frame or the B frame's origin with respect to the N frame plus stuff that comes from the uh, transport theorem. So we've got that. Now, what about acceleration? This is the, just the, this is the inertial velocity of P. What about the inertial acceleration? And that'll lead us to our five part acceleration formula. So the inertial acceleration, following the way the book writes stuff, acceleration of P with respect to the N frame, which would be, right, this would be the inertial derivative or derivative with respect to time and the N frame of velocity, inertial velocity of P with respect to the N frame. Now we would just, carry things through. So let me write inertial derivative of uh, the velocity of the origin of the B frame plus the derivative with respect to the B frame of rho. So how the point P appears to be moving with respect to B frame plus omega BN cross rho. Just carry all the terms through and we'll get some stuff. Um, it's probably more important to interpret it than to, uh, to derive it. So, I would say, you know, C section 1.3.4 for the steps. But this is what we arrive at, okay. We get the five part acceleration formula. So it's the acceleration of P as seen by the B frame plus the acceleration of the origin of the B frame as seen by the N frame, plus this is an alpha B with respect to N cross rho. Got to say what that is, what is alpha? It is the, the derivative of the, the time derivative of the angular acceleration, uh, angular velocity. So it's the angular acceleration. And the, the weird thing is you get the same value whether you write this with respect to the N frame or the B frame. So we just call it alpha. So this is with respect to the N frame and strangely is the same thing if you write it with respect to the B frame. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm gonna need some room to label that that term. So this is the angular acceleration vector. This takes into account that the B frame might not be rotating steadily, it might be non-uniform. Uh, what else? We got some other things. We got the Coriolis 
two omega b with respect to n cross velocity of p seen by the b frame plus omega cross omega cross rho. And then we can start naming things if we want. This is the, the Coriolis acceleration. This part is the centripetal acceleration. And this term up here is sometimes called the Euler term because it doesn't have any other name. It's due to, you know, it's due to non-uniform rotation. So this has five parts to it, five terms. So that's the five part acceleration formula. So this is just an alternative way to get the acceleration. You could just do straightforward application of the transport theorem like I did for that ring and slider problem and you'll get the same thing. Some people maybe prefer to look at it in this way. Sometimes you have multiple frames. Forgot about that. We need to talk about multiple frames. This is a big deal. You might be saying, Dr. Ross, I'm having a hard enough time with just like one frame, but two frames, I don't know. Uh, Need we discuss any more frames? Yeah, yeah, we do. There's, there's lots of lots of frames. Here's my my drawing. An N frame, and then uh, let's just say we've got a B frame up here, maybe. Uh, no, I'll call this the A frame. So. There's an A-frame. I don't mean an A-frame house. It's a frame I'll just give, uh, I'll just the A-frame. It's the N-frame. And maybe we've got a B-frame. You could have zillions of frames. And they're all, it could be rotating with respect to each other. The angular velocities will add up in a a way that should make sense. So I'm just going to sort of sketch. So there's an omega of the B frame with respect to the A frame, let's say. Maybe that's the most convenient thing to measure. And then there's an angular velocity of the A frame with respect to the N frame. But what if you wanted to know, you know, what is omega of the B frame with respect to the N frame in terms of angular velocities that you know, and that can be done. If we wanna give it a fancy name, we'll call it the angular velocity addition formula. Here's the formula. Omega of B with respect to A plus omega of A with respect to N. That's it, they just, they add up. I like writing it this way because you notice over here, there's B and then there's N. And over here, you've got B, A and A, N, but you've got the A's sort of near each other. So it's like they cancel out or something. I don't know, you have to figure out your own mnemonic to remember this. There's also, if you have the frame, a frame rotating, like the A frame rotating with respect to the N frame. How is the N frame rotating with respect to the A frame? So omega of N with respect to A is gonna be negative of A with respect to N. You are thinking, oh my goodness, what? Okay, so if I have, here's two frames. If the blue frame, I'm gonna have the blue frame you know, rotating. I will move, curl my fingers in the direction that the blue frame is rotating with respect to this and uh, red frame. 
So it looks like the angular, um, it's got some angular rate and the axis is pointing up this way. Well, now what do things look like from the, the blue frames perspective? Well, now it, from the blue frames perspective, it looks like the red frame is kind of is rotating the opposite way. So using the same kind of right hand approach, fingers curling in the direction the red frame is going, my thumb is pointing down, so the negative direction. So it's kind of like, which frame are you on? And that's what type of rotation you will see. You think about this enough, hopefully it'll make sense. I, this one doesn't have a name, it just is. And this is, this holds between any reference frames. Like if there was a C frame or something, then I, you know, omega of what? C with respect to B, then we would have omega of C with respect to N is omega of C with respect to B plus B with respect to A plus A with respect to N, et cetera. So you could do as many frames as you want, all right? Let's look at an example, okay? So here an example. With lots of frames. The solar system has plenty of different frames. <laughs> Forget about the UFO for now. UFO's there to, just to distract you, as UFOs often do. But we're looking at a simplified planetary system where there's an inertial frame fixed in the sun, and everything's in the same plane here. So life should be easy. We've got this N frame fixed in the sun. And then there, I want you to think of an E frame that's moving with the earth. So in that frame, we'll write it this way, E R, E phi, because we're using phi to describe the angle. And then for the, for the moon, there's another frame, maybe I'll use maroon or something. So this is, let me use M. M R, that's an M sub R, and then M theta. So we've got that there's a rotation of the, the angular velocity of the, the moon fixed frame with respect to the earth frame. And then there's angular velocity of the uh, E frame, the earth frame with respect to the inertial frame fixed in the sun. And if I wanted to know, you know, what is the moon frame with respect to the N frame? Well, it would be omega M with respect to E plus E with respect to N, where I'm kind of thinking of the E's cancel. They don't. Um, the way we've written this, so this, look at this angle for the moon. So the way that the moon is rotating with respect to the earth, it's got an angular rate theta dot. And the, there's a direction coming out of the screen and it's always the same direction, so N3. And then this would be phi dot N3. So if you were to just add these two, they're in the same direction. So we'd have theta dot plus V dot and three. Okay, so far so good, nice.